episode 21 of Strange Brow Radio. I'm your host, Tobe Johnson, and we took a week off. Some of you noticed that. I got some emails regarding the lack of a show last week. I'll explain what happened, and it's a sad, sad tale. I still can't talk about it. First, I have to talk about our sponsor. Pulled Together, Feral by Aaron at Etsy.com. Go check out shaman-inspired smudge, fans, rattles, and beautiful drums. Poplar-framed, elk-soaked drums, just to name one of the styles, including a Sasquatch drum that I made. It's not online, but it looks like it may be one heck of a wedding gift. Sasquatch drum by Feral by Aaron at Etsy.com actually soaked in a reported Sasquatch hair from the Al Moon property. Maybe I'll put some pictures up online. All right, coming up, we have guest Lorraine Reiner, Ron Moorhead, Sean Fay, and myself. I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. We'll be right back. As I said, we took a week off. And I had a special interview lined up. It uh, was an interview I drove some three and a half hours to get from a local witness that had a UFO sighting out of Benita, Oregon. I scheduled the interview, booked uh, this willing participant to sit down with me at a local bar in Eugene. And sadly, somehow, some way, I deleted the file. And I couldn't retrieve it. And I didn't want to reschedule the interview with someone who already put themselves out. So we lost a file. And if I can ever get it back, I'll air that episode. But uh, it was a great, great addition to Strange Brow. But for now, it's on hold. However, that's not going to stop us moving forward. Episode 21. Today we have special guest Lorraine Reiner whose family members were actually the logging operation up at the top of Bluff Creek. They made the initial report to Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. She just happened to live in the same town, looked me up, and uh, we had a sit-down interview. Also, she had an incredible UFO encounter, and I believe we're going to start there with Lorraine and move into what happened on Bluff Creek before... Patty was Patty, so to speak. Then we sit down with Bob Gimlin over Memorial Day weekend here at the Casa. And Sean Fay, of course, Ron Moorhead is responsible for the Sierra Sounds. And actually will be at the Axon Fiddle in Cottage Grove, Oregon, 657 East Main Street, the second Saturday of July doing our Secrets of the Sasquatch conference. There'll be some other surprise guests. By the way, this is a free show. It was a paid show. This is going to be a free show. So go to strangebrow.com to learn more about your opportunity to see Ron in person. Also, joining us uh, over a cup of coffee is Dogman Witness times two, Sean Fay out of Cottage Grove, Oregon, and... We just were sitting down, uh, having both those guys over as guests to the house, and we just started to dig a little bit deeper into the mysteries of the dog man, and I think it ends up on Johnny Cash somehow, but it's not every day you get to sit down and and talk uh, with Ron uh, openly about his experiences, and then just kind of relax and BS with uh, legends and legend of Sasquatch research. So that's what we're doing, two special interviews today, and I will do my best to uncover the Fern Ridge Vanita massive mothership triangle sighting that uh, I just took. So without further ado, so without further ado, I give to you Lorraine Reiner, UFO witness and family member of the original logging crew that reported Patty up in Bluff Creek, California. So we're here with Lorraine Reiner, who is going to tell us about her encounter 
with a red orange ball of light i imagine uh, this would probably go in the category of a ufo sighting so lorraine tell us your story i was about um eight years old in eureka california uh let me see that would have been about 1959 um i was leaving my grandparents home on 2714 pine street running across the playground and over my left shoulder I saw a ball of light coming at me I fell straight to the ground and the ball went over the top of me and passed me mm -hmm. it scared me to the point where I I didn't know what was that I thought it was fire coming at me I got up and ran home immediately afterwards told my mom and, and uh, dad what had happened and they didn't believe me they said, oh, I was, you know, m making it up. But I know in my mind and in my heart, I'm telling the truth. Right. I, I saw what I saw, and um, it really happened. I've heard more stories over the years of similar sightings, and I believe that there was something out there that came at me, but it passed right over the top of me, and then it was gone. So how close did you actually get to it? Uh, it hit probably was maybe 20 to 50 feet over the top of me, and it just rolled past. Okay, so it rolled. Kind of. It, Did you see, like, just, texture to it, like you would see a ball of light? It was like a ball of light, and like almost like fire, uh, like a fireball going over the top but of But not me. fire? No. What made it different than fire? The, it, it was light. It was... A burst of light going over the top of me. Right. No heat. No heat. No I any any sound. Heat. No. No. Sound. No. It just mm -hmm. a, a rush past me. I could. I just know that I felt it go past me, and 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 then it was gone. I looked up, and it was gone. And you were just minding your own business. There was no yeah. warm up to this story. You didn't see anything beforehand. No. No, I saw nothing beforehand. There were no kids in the playground. Um, it was late afternoon, mm -hmm. um, probably four thirty, five o'clock in the afternoon, because I had to go home to eat dinner. Right. And that was. The, and normally, there would have been other children in the area, but it was like no one there. Was so, that unusual? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it was very unusual, but um, I didn't think anything of it at the time, and I've just mm. didn't, you know, didn't know how it would affect me or <laughs> right. if if it affected me at all. So what happened after it passed you? You ran. You I were... just ran, got up from the ground and mm. ran as fast as I could to go home. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long a period of time that was. Just I know that when I saw it coming at me. I fell down to the ground, and when I got up, it, it was gone. So this is your only sighting? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, do you feel like there's any more to the story that uh, you don't remember? Is it so burned in your brain that every detail is there? Um, I believe that that's all that I, right. that I remember and experienced. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there was anything more because that right but, no, no but missing no missing time or you didn't have your i uh, don't I don't know for sure right if I, you know from the time I left my grandparents to the time I got home mm -hmm. if there was much time left there mm -hmm. yeah, the part that I, not only that interests me is the fact that there is no other kids mm -hmm. out when there should have been, mm -hmm. which is something I've heard before in response to orbs mm -hmm. is that there's almost a sudden absence of people mm -hmm. you're the th at least the third or fourth witness that i've spoken to mm -hmm. um about that which is really interesting like if there's a link a link um it's a possibility <laughs> yeah you know because what do you think that would be like do you ever think outside the box about why stopping that would be time okay your yeah. words <laughs> my words yeah well i mean that's that's how yeah. The the only answer I could give is that maybe there's a stop in time, and for some reason I went through mm -hmm. to that point. 
it's a question for all of us, I guess. Right. Maybe they delay time somehow or sp split you into an ulterior or alternative time period. Mm -hmm. um, well, we don't know what our dimensions are. Mm -hmm. We're only in our own dimension here. I believe that there has to be something else mm -hmm. or someone else mm -hmm. outside of our. Okay, and the reason we started talking is you overheard me talking about the podcast and talking about um, Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned that your grandfather knew something about Bluff Creek and about the, the logging road or operation where Patty walks. So tell us a little bit about your grandfather. Uh, my grandfather and his brother were loggers in the um, Humboldt County area for since the 1940s. Um, I do know that he was a legitimate man. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he wouldn't have made anything up if mm -hmm. he hadn't seen it with his own eyes. Right. I remember the day that, that um, they found the footprints, in, and I was told... Um, through conversations in the family about how they saw the footprints uh, walking around the equipment in the landing where they had been logging. Um, there had been a 55-gallon drum of fuel that had been picked up and, and scratched like the lid had been trying to be torn off. Mm -hmm. um, that it had been picked up, and it was a full 55-gallon drum, so it was heavy. It wasn't something that a single person that would normally be able to lift on their own. Right. Lifted it and threw it up over the embankment and down over the bluff a little ways. Um, the family uh, uh, photo took photos that day. Um, I'm going to see if I can get a hold of my uncle, mm -hmm. who was also there. Um, and he could verify everything that I've just this said. This is your grandfather's brother? No, his or son. His son, mm -hmm. yeah. That would make more sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I've never been to Bluff Creek, but the fact that you're saying that one of these barrels was thrown over the bluff, mm -hmm. this is why they called it Bluff Creek, is because there's an actual bluff over there. there. Was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't know that. I knew that there were diesel barrels thrown. Mm-hmm. But, um, well, this, this little, I said a bluff, it's like from where the landing was. Have you they, ever been there? Um, I was near there, but not to that you site. You never walked not to, to the site. site, no, but you would want to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. If I, if my uncle could tell us exactly where it was, you betcha I would go just to see, yeah, and see if we could experience something because I truly believe that there is Bigfoot. Yeah, <laughs> do you think there's a link between what you saw when you were a kid and? Sasquatch? Um, I don't know if it's a link, but I... Oh, we're getting down now. <laughs> this is... Uh, that's all right. Now we can edit that out. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's a link between Sasquatch and what I saw as a fireball, mm -hmm. but I do believe that there's more to our, our Earth mm -hmm. than what we experience in day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Hmm. And I asked you earlier as if it was possible to get a hold of anything from the logging site because there's very few examples of artifacts besides mm -hmm. Patty's footprints. Footprint. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, it would probably be doubtful to think at this point there is. Uh, but what did you ever hear about um, there being more to the story uh, besides Patty just being filmed? There's some real urban legends about... The logging operation may be hiring bounty hunters to come take care of a problem. Did you ever hear of anything like that? Uh, no, not not from my family. Okay. Yeah. So that was not um, spoken of. Not. Mm -mm. Okay. Not that I can remember or recall anyway. And I I have very vi mm -hmm. a vivid remembrance of what happened during that time. I because it was important to our family. Yeah. You know. How about uh, anyone in a costume? Did you ever hear that? I heard about costumes afterwards. Yeah. Um, people trying to make um, excuses for what they actually, right. what they saw. You, you know, never or, heard of anything behind the channels like, that was just a guy in a costume. That was. Um, oh, I heard those things, but I didn't believe them. But not from of, your family. No, not from my family. Yeah. No. The people on the ground. Now, did your uh, mm -hmm. grandfather make the initial report? 
and who did he you know reach what? it? That's what I'm going to find yeah. out from my uncle Jim. Uh -huh. Jim Hedrick is my uncle that was right. there at that time also. Right. I'm going to ask him who contacted Humboldt State, mm -hmm. if he knew knows if it was our grandfather, his father, mm -hmm. or um, someone else. Mm -hmm. um, I know that 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 uh, during that time, uh, my grandmother lived in a in a trailer at a camp at a mobile park with the rest of the family. Um, the women stayed at home during the daytime while the men were out working. <laughs> uh, right. My grandmother, I'll tell you this about the Indian ladies that were picking berries with her one afternoon. Um, and the one Indian lady told my grandmother that she needed to leave, um, that she could smell the odor of Bigfoot. And they, the Indians in Hoopa believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can talk to most of the Indian people there, and they'll tell you that there is Bigfoot. They know that there's something out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a pretty familiar story that uh, you'll hear during berry season. Is mm -hmm. that it's time to go? They know something's up. It's all about respect and safety. But mm -hmm. it seems like respect time respect, and time again. Respect is a big thing, mm -hmm. a and I think that's how our family felt. Also, mm -hmm. you know about um, we know there's something there. So, but we don't want to bother it. Don't want to, you know, hurt. Right. So, um, as far as the property was concerned, after uh, Roger and Bob shot the video and John Green came down and everyone took casts and measurements, mm -hmm. like, oh my goodness. So, would, one of the questions I would have, too, for your uncle, is what happened afterwards, after the scene was basically just, like, yeah. exposed. Did mm -hmm. they st continue to log? Did they continue to have encounters and stories that nobody heard of? Uh, that's the something that I yeah. think that's something that um, my uncle Jim would be able to yeah. answer. I do know that they continued to work. Yeah, you oh, know, they but... continued to mm -hmm. log up there. Mm -hmm. Again, Lorraine Reiner is her name. We got a lot of information out of that interview. Gosh, there could be some relics hidden in Northern California that people have forgotten about related to Bluff Creek. I mean, there could be some eight millimeter film who knows it's just an incredible thought i will let you know if anything becomes of that interview i hope it does let's take a break here for our sponsor we'll be right back i want to thank our sponsor feral by aaron yet again now i've mentioned time time again on the show that feral by aaron is our one sponsor but with a sponsor like this, you don't need any more because the fact is that these spirit tools actually work. And what do they work with? Well, they work with the elements of the earth and they're housed and built by an artisan out of the Olympic Peninsula, Aaron Jackson. Check out Feral by Aaron, E-R-Y-N at Etsy.com. Drums, rattles, smudge sticks, and coming soon, alchemy boxes. These are one of a kind each one one of a kind we're not talking about a factory here and as two people told me her instruments sing in particular the drums so check out feral by aaron give a like review subscribe share go on the instagram and give a little love may give it right back to you feral by aaron at etsy.com feral by aaron just got a major boost let's put it that way a major boost and it goes without saying that i want to talk about it marcia k moore invited herself into our lives and we happily accepted after we met her at a conference in washington marcia k moore cmr studios uh, was also a contributor last friday on ancient aliens she helped and with the digital rendering of what is known as the Badlands Guardian. I don't know if anybody saw that, but look up Marcia and her work and go to CMR Studios and you can see her amazing digital renderings, her amazing clay, well, 
it's a polymer clay sculptures, almost forensic sculptures of the elongated heads, uh, the Peruvian ones in particular. But of course, these elongated skulls uh, are all over the world. Just we have our hands on them more so than not down in South America. So you can see her work with the elongated skulls and then, of course, her work as a digital artist. Anyway, we recently started working together, sponsor Pharaoh by Aaron and Marcia, on the drums in particular. And Marcia is a brilliant sketch artist as well. So the drums have been given to Marcia. They have been sketched on by Marcia. And the outcome is just so good. So we'll have those up soon on probably the Feral by Aaron website or the Etsy shop. I know that they're going to be housed in a in a art gallery. And so big things are coming with uh, Marcia K. Moore and Feral by Aaron. So we're happy to have her on board. And I look forward to talking about her work more and more as a side-by-side sponsor for Strange Brow Radio. Okay, next we have... Ron Moorhead and Sean Fay sitting around having a cup of coffee on Memorial Day weekend here at the cabin. It's a great, great conversation. Let's start with the double dog man conversation and work our way through it. Here we go. All right. It is Memorial Day weekend. We're out here in Port Orchard, Washington with Ron Moorhead and Sean Fay, and we're having a cup of coffee. And I thought while the ladies were out in the back part, Talking about us, most likely, right? No. Probably talking. I think they were talking about mermaids. Last I heard, they're in a mermaid discussion. Oh. But uh, Sean has been waiting to talk to me. I've been waiting to talk to him regarding his interview. We had a chance back in 2018 to get into the dog man sighting that he had. Would you call it a dog man sighting that you had, first of all? Um, possibly. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, you know, given what people describe as a dog man Mm -hmm. that would probably be what i would best describe it as okay um it has let us know uh the the first sighting that i had was uh on the way to work probably 4 30 ish in the morning still dark um just outside uh between silverton mount angel caught something in the headlights thought it was maybe uh like a small black bear on the side of the road and it stood up um as i approached and it was uh I realized it wasn't a black bear at that point. It was very, you know, human-like person. Um, And it looked over its shoulder, its left shoulder, at the car when I was coming up. And it turned to the right and started to run off the side of the road. And when it did that, I noticed that its legs were, I guess you'd say, dog-legged. They weren't shaped like humans. Like the hawk-legged? Yeah, it was backwards. The kneecaps, the legs bent backwards to what we would normally see. Um. That was pretty much just a quick sighting. Happened probably over the period of maybe seven to ten seconds as I went by. Um, two weeks later, I was running the same route going to work. Later in the day, it was light out. Was going through Mount Angel right about the time they were building the new fest hall for uh, Oktoberfest. And was looking over into a field off to what would be my right side as I was driving up. Because I had a bunch of equipment stuff out there and... Just something happened to catch my eye, and I looked back forward, and there was something standing right off of the front bumper of the car in the middle of the road. Uh, so I hit the brakes thinking maybe there was a person or something out there. It really, you know, kind of caught me by surprise. And <clears throat> as I went by, this thing kind of bent down a little bit, looked in the side window of the car, and uh, it had a very human looking face, with the exception of if somebody were to take the I guess it would be the the upper and lower jaw section from about the nose down and pulled it out about an inch or so. Um, it it just it, uh, it it didn't have the the long muzzle of a dog, but it didn't have the like flat face of a human. It was somewhere in between, like mid stage of growth. Uh, yeah, or you know maybe that's all it was. Yeah. I don't know. It Any just, clothing? Like no. No, no. It's just a solid coat of kind of dark, stringy. I guess you'd call it like German Shepherd-like hair. Um, you can see the skin underneath. Um, very, you know, it wasn't uh, 
not like your typical dog coat where you can't see the skin. This was kind of a, a sparse hair, um, enough to cover, you know, all over its body, but not enough to fully cover the skin. You can see like muscles and yeah, you can, you can see, see the skin underneath yeah. the hair. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't fully, you know, this fur coat style, um, and I don't really remember anything other than probably about the shoulders up of it because it had kind of bent down, leaned forward a little bit. So it was really all that I had in focus at that time was just its face. And uh, that was the one thing that kind of stuck out to me was is it just looked very human-like with hair covering over its entire face, but the mouth area was protruding out more so than your average person's would. What was its demeanor towards you? Uh, it looked very confused or questioning, like uh, probably had almost the same expression I had on my face, kind of a, a surprise. Um, scared? Did it look no, like? it didn't seem no. scared. It just seemed very maybe confused and curious. Uh-huh. Um, I hit the brakes and as I went by, and it ended up, you know, I drove past it at that point when I got stopped. Looked in the rearview mirror, side mirrors, I didn't see it anywhere. I thought maybe it had ducked in behind the car and squatted down. So I pulled forward and nothing was there. And I never saw anything of it after that. Uh, I, I don't know where it actually went. Um, in that area, you've probably got at least 50 to 100 yards either side of the road that's clear. It's all just open farm fields. Mm-hmm. And I looked all around and didn't see any trace of where it had went. It was just like it had, as soon as I went past, it had just vanished. And, uh, you know, almost like it appeared for a few seconds as I drove by and then just disappeared. Are it, there legends or rumors in that area? Because Silverton in general, if people don't know, Silverton, Oregon is farm fields. It's a lot of produce and things like that going on out there. But they have a lot of UFO stuff, too. Yeah, there's been a few reported Sasquatch or Bigfoot sightings out that way that after this happened, I kind of looked into them. And there was, I think, two reported ones that were somewhere within a a two or three mile radius of that area. Mm -hmm. Um, But nothing that was confirmed or, you know, really talked about. Right. Um, Most people, you know, in town, you know, bring up the topic to them, but... Uh, for the most part, there really didn't seem to be a whole lot of activity that we could find, at least that was reported. And no chance, obviously, you got a good look at it. It was a guy in a costume, no way. No, I, I don't think, a, it'd be highly unlikely that it a person... sounds like it would be like a $4,000, $7,000 costume. Yeah, yeah, and why somebody would be standing out in the middle right. of the road at 6.30 or 7 o'clock yeah. in the morning, you know, right yeah. after daybreak, would be a mystery, mm-hmm. um, you know, there... There wasn't any festivals or any anything going there wasn't on. A Dogman festival. No, no. no and Oktoberfest hadn't kicked in, so the the drunks haven't showed up yet. So. Right, right. It wasn't ladies' night at yeah. the dog club, <laughs> the dog house. Yeah. So uh, you know, I I told Lisa about it, my my girlfriend, my wife now, and uh, we started looking around. Like I said, did a little research and didn't find a whole lot in the area other than two sightings. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty a pretty isolated incident and it just happened to be in a two-week time frame and I could only assume what I saw was probably the same creature kind of fit the bill both times yeah how odd is that that you would have two chance encounters with the same one I mean how many are around there first of all yeah I mean and what you know there's there's not a population around otherwise there'd be stories of them around there and yeah you know I hadn't heard of anybody talking about anything or saying anything about any cryptid type creatures or anything in the area yeah you want to pull that chair forward ron you're welcome to that we can get closer to the table we're gonna bring ron just poured himself a cup of joe he likes it black all right let's ask ron what he thinks since you've had a lot of time in the brush in the bush in the back alleys you've seen everything ron but have you ever seen a dog man never seen a dog man heard stories about them. I don't doubt that they could exist, given my philosophy on how all these things exist, which is a uh, alien intervention into uh, our three-dimensional atmosphere. And what was the last part? Alien intervention into, into... our three-dimensional Oh, world. got you. Yeah. yeah. And, quantum. Uh, yeah, quantum. Uh, That's the new term, by the way. They got rid of woo, and now everybody <laughs> says, we're quantum. 
Yeah, okay. How do you feel about that? I like it better than the woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have heard uh, through somebody that says they know, because they've seen this, uh, Dogman, uh, they're actually out here to hunt the, the good Bigfoots that are out there. So like a predator situation. Predator, that's what I've heard. I don't know how valid that is. Okay. But uh, it's a theory that's out there. These things are here to hunt them. And no chance, Sean, and since Ron's here, that you saw, since this alien intervention and Ron's theory messing with human and animal DNA, let's say, could that have been a baboon? Since it had a snout and the ears maybe in? No. No. I mean, it's uh, a baboon's face. Is, it still has more of a canine type. The you know jaw's right. more pronounced and pulled. Um, this just... Uh, like I said, it, it was almost human, but not quite. It, it could have been, you know, like a. I guess you could find a deformity like that, and one in a one in a million, one in a trillion type thing in a in a human. But uh, uh, are there any uh, reservations or Native American uh, places where something like a shapeshifter or a skinwalker would maybe say live in that area? Have you ever heard? As far as I know, there's nothing Indian reservation-wise around there. It's all farmland that, uh, you know, um, immigrants, I guess, have farmed for the time being. It's, you know, there's a lot of Spanish and Russian influence in there for big produce, big agriculture, lots of little roadside fruit stands and vegetable stands and stuff like that, and a lot of farmland-type, you know, haying and whatnot going on out there, so... Mm -hmm. Immigrants working, you know, 14-hour days kind of situation. Um, it's not too far off of I-5 North in Oregon, north of Salem, near what they call the Abaqua Basin, not too far from. And Tom Powell, who wrote the book The Locals and uh, Shady Neighbors, uh, also wrote Fringes of Science, talks about the Abaqua Basin. It was one of the first places he mentioned not to go. Why would that be? What What's up with the Abaqua Basin? Uh, I... That I don't know. Um, I've been there a couple of times, and you get a very uneasy feeling being down in there, like you're always being watched or monitored. Um, you can never pinpoint what. Um, we've been down in there with a the dog a couple of times, and they're always on high alert, it seems. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a uneasy feeling to be down in that basin down by the waterfalls and mm -hmm. some of that area. Um, not a whole lot of people mm -hmm. up that way. You kind of duck out of civilization about 20 minutes prior to getting up there and um you know really you got camp dakota which is kind of a paintball camp that sets up there and that's about the last little bit of civilization before you start getting into a bunch of logging area and so children at play things like that there's yeah. schools out there yeah there's uh i don't know of any schools but there's basically that's pretty much the last stop along the road is the little paintball facility. I meant, school, I meant schools of dogmen, oh. okay? That's what I'm calling them. <laughs> now, your, your stepdaughter, too, saw a weird light out that way. Was that in the same area? I believe that was from probably somewhere between Salem and Silverton. Um, so kind of 60 miles or less. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. easily. What, um, do you remember what she saw? I wish she was here to tell us, but it was rather bizarre. I believe what she described was a uh, it's like a giant green ball of light that kind of appeared out in front of her and dissolved over the front of the car, I think, as she got closer. She, like, um, drove through this ball. Yeah, and it just dissolved around the front of the car and dissipated. Mm -hmm. um, so what that was, I have no idea. Um, there's been some, uh, like you said, plenty of UFO or type sightings out there, odd anomalies and stuff mm -hmm. like that that people have seen mm -hmm. Ron you I've talked to you about this before but you've seen odd anomalies out in the Sierras you've seen strange lights you saw what you called like a lightsaber floating mm -hmm. horizontally through the woods with Carrie yes yeah yeah and that was just in 2016 we was up at the Sierra camp and uh, we were both laying there during the night and yeah, it looked like a lifesaver from Star Wars or something just comes floating to the trees mm -hmm. about 40 feet above us. Uh, not above us, but uh, horizontal from us. And actually, that's going to be in uh, Pilates' film that's going to be debuted later in June. Oh, can you tell us anything about this? Uh, I'm not supposed to. Okay. <laughs> By the time this airs, it probably will be there. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a film coming out. You're a part of it. That's 
call the Hunters 411, uh, Missing Hunters 411. Okay. Uh, and uh, they spent quite a bit on trying to recreate that lightsaber going through the trees when they were up there with the other. The only filming crew I've ever taken up there, and that was last year, just before the whole area burnt, caught on fire. And uh, I'm glad I took them up there now because it's gotten documented and, and uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the events have been documented. And, but uh, they've, they've recreated the, the lightsaber going through the trees, he said. He said they spent a lot of money just doing that. <laughs> I'm anxious to see it. I'm flying back to Denver uh, here in a couple of weeks to be the debut of the uh, film. Mm. Okay. So you, you're you saying that the Sierra camp is no more. No, the camp is there. It's just the trees are probably burning. <laughs> but actually, I flew over in a small plane after the fires and uh, with a friend of mine, and, uh, and we looked it over. I took some pictures of it. Uh, and it doesn't look like the whole area is burnt up. It just looks like uh, may have underburnt, and uh, a lot of the mountainsides have burnt up, and the mm-hmm. canyons have burnt. But uh, the whole area right where the camp is looks like it may have been some of it salvaged. So mm-hmm. I think someone's going to go up there this summer and check it out for us. Okay. You brought some of your saddles and ropes and things up when we did the Sierra Camp recreation there. I feel like some of that stuff should be in a museum. You know, some of the stuff from the Sierra Camp is a part of Bigfoot lore. So is that ever, have you ever been asked to put any of your gear inside a museum? Well, the pack saddles that we have, I still have those. And those, uh, Yosemite, uh, Yosemite was, was trying to get me to put them in their museum in Yosemite because they were historical. Uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Uh, Chester Moyle, uh, who had them originally in 1942, the year I was born, actually. <laughs> okay. And uh, I got a picture of him leading the pack strength. He was one of the first uh, packers to take people into Yosemite. And those saddles were used then. I've had them rebuilt. And because of that, I didn't, I didn't put them in the museum because they're still usable saddles now. But I'm never going to use them again, probably. Yeah, there's at least two or three good museums that are hosting Bigfoot lore stuff. So if anybody's listening... All run up, get those saddles in there. They need to be behind lucite glass for the public to take a look at. So, well, I ha- you have to have the picture with it. Just you do. Point. I got the picture. It looks like a, a Ansel Adams picture. And it yeah. might be actually. Uh, and these are these are crazy looking saddles too. I remember seeing them because you brought them, and they have like did they have like a wooden frame well, kind of attached to them too. Uh, Hammetries. They got the cross up there, so you can mm-hmm. hang the pack saddles, pack oh, bags gotcha, over. So you can hang gear. Yeah. yeah. And the, the hammetries are called. And uh, I got the actual bags we used too, and mm-hmm. the bags he used, which are pretty well beaten now. But uh, yeah, that's a mm-hmm. quite an artifact. So I don't quite know what to do with those. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to be riding probably much anymore. I mean, I might be riding, but I don't, don't I'll own any pack mules. And uh, no more of those Zora moves where you're up on two legs. With your bull whip. <laughs> well, we rode up there last year, like I say, with a filming crew, and uh, that, was, that was the last time I've ridden up there, and that was in 2018. Yeah. I may have caught a peek of some of those photos I once or twice. I sold my rifle, the rifle I had down there. I sold oh, you sold that rifle? During hunting season. Yes. Okay. So I wanted it, so I sold And I've sold all my saddles, except for those two-pack saddles. Wait a second. Did you sell your rifle to a fan of yours, no. or just a guy? No just a guy okay yeah he don't know what it's about <laughs> that's kind of a shame darn it i i should have that rifle history that he's no. carrying around now he doesn't no well, i've still got a lot of guns do you yeah, six I, shooters i got pistols and rifles so i don't uh, worry about not having something if i need it but i don't think i'll be hunting anymore that's now we're we're playing johnny cash on the Bluetooth speaker, actually. It's Alexa playing Johnny Cash in the back. I don't know if you guys can hear it. You hear the familiar tung 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 in the background. Ron, you've had a chance to probably hang out with some people since you're from that part of the country in Northern California. All over L.A. probably had some industries and restaurants that you sold. Did you ever get a chance to hang out with someone like Johnny Cash? Because you're a musician. I never hung out with him. I saw him when he was young, when he yeah. first started uh, performing out. Him and Luther, his guitar player in uh, Eureka, California, actually, when I was just a teenager. So you saw a young Johnny. I seen young Elvis, too, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I seen uh, him, and I, he was so young, in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Cash was a lot. It was in the uh, 60s. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was kind of back in his drugging days, too, when he was still a wild cat. And he was skinny back in those days. Like, he was frail. And he got to be kind of a bulky individual. Yeah, actually, his uh, singing and guitar playing by Luther got me into playing wanting to play music because it's so simple. That's where I'm leading to. Did you bring your guitar? No. No, we should have <laughs> asked you to bring your guitar. Which one? I've got, uh, I've got you mm-hmm. know, three or four now, yeah. Do you think playing music in the woods, has that ever elicited any kind of interaction for you? No, not that I know of. I mean, uh, uh, we never, you can't just take something up there to the camp very easily. It's just right. too much of a trip. So we never took anything like that up there, but uh, we've thought about, like we've played music, we've played sounds, we've done mm-hmm. a lot of things trying to make something happen, but what we found is you can't make something happen. You just have to sit down and wait and mm-hmm. see if it's going to happen. If it happens, it happens. You can't be the aggressor in these things. you got to be just there. And be so nobody even brought a harmonica or the spoons? or yeah. well, He must have had that. something. Carrie brought that whatever it is. Oh, did she bring her little bowl? That, bowl that right singing there? bowl? Her hand pan? Yeah. yeah. Ron's wife, Carrie, has like... Um, it looks like a little UFO that you beat with mallets, and it's called a singing bowl. Is hand that the pan. hand pan? It's it's totally cool looking, but it'll put you to sleep real quick. <laughs> no, so I mean, once in a while, I'll play the flute out in the woods, and I think that we've got good responses from playing the flute. And I know there's a derogatory, you know, people use that as a derogatory term for people like us but we're quantum now we're not flute players <laughs> i'm gonna have to come up with a new award for strange brow the quantum award it'd be much cooler like a little spiral or something what about um any new books in the work for you i mean quantum bigfoot was took you probably at least a couple of years to write if not more are you working on something no i'm not okay. uh, i uh, thought about quantum over 10 years ago and it did take me two years to put it together you know, it's just uh, a lot of research went into that mm-hmm. just uh you don't want to make a mistake when you talk about physics like that so you want to get the background on it and mm-hmm. it takes a lot so i i think i put it together in a Bringing uh, science and spirituality back together because I think quantum physics and spirituality are on the same plane. They're synonymous, in my opinion. I started reading stuff that even the uh, mm-hmm. ancient text talks about, you know, how some of those things that happened years ago, and you've got the Greek mythology and you've got the ancient texts about how aliens have been here and how different things have happened. Mm-hmm. And how that falls into quantum physics is pretty interesting. People mm-hmm. need to catch up on that before they call us woo-woos. <laughs> Did you get a chance to talk to Pearl Parada when you were at Tom Cantrell's Primal People convention? There was a uh, gal there by the name of Pearl Parada. Did you get a chance to meet her? I may have. Okay. I got a good memory, just not as long as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> she has a theory about working with uh, certain types of rocks as far as she lived out uh, in Ording on the Carbon River. She kind of was a, a homesteader, let's say, on the riverfront. She had Bigfoot interactions. Mm. And what she would find is that there was, and I don't remember the kind of rock that she would find, but it would be hammered and there would be a pestle near it. And there would be this chalky white substance left on the top of the rocks. And I don't know how she got from that to the fact that that particular chemical is also used in cloaking technology but that's where she went with this white powder that she would find on the carbon river very smart woman i was completely blown away you've had a chance to meet her like she's a a custodian by day but by night she should work for nasa yeah yeah she's a very interesting person to sit down and talk to yeah um i wish i had way more time to sit and chat with her yeah, what I'm we looking did. on the bookshelf right now because I know her book is up here and I'm it's skipping my mind. But uh, if you have a chance, look up the name Pearl Parada. I don't know the pronunciation, but definitely look for her book on there. And if Erin was at home, I'd ask her what the name of the book was. But she um, she's an underutilized. There's a lot of underutilized resources, people that just don't want to deal with the politics of Bigfoot and all of the drama and they just step way back and maybe they write a book and that's it but you know Pearl is one of those people have you Ron ever thought about pulling way back from the phenomena and saying you know I, I've done my work I've left out you know this anthology of research 
have you ever got so maybe frustrated that you're just like, I just need to, you know, take some time off? Yes. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's happened. Uh, but I can't. I get too many calls, too many people wanting to hear things and talk to me. I got several responses I got to get on to when I get back and uh, interviews that I people still have to me to do. And, mm-hmm. and I need to do that because I do think I know things that people want to hear and need to hear. Mm-hmm. about uh, how the world and the universe really works. It's not in the classical science of our material and physical mm-hmm. beings. It's in the quantum realm, and uh, it's how everything works. Mm-hmm. We just have to live with what we got, and that's three-dimensional stuff. Oh, yeah, okay. So we're looking at, sorry to interrupt here, Ron. Sean has a smartphone, which is obviously very smart, and we're looking at Amazon Prime, and here is Pearl Parada's book. If you have a chance, go look for... Paradas, first of all, is spelled P-R-I-H-O-D-A, P-R-I-H-O-D-A, for 1999. There's a paperback book called Manotang, Man-O-Tang, O-T-A-N-G, Manotang, Bigfoot Myth or Reality. And um, she, in my opinion, is an underutilized resource. In fact, we got the first interview of her. She'd never spoken on the record except for this book. So if you go back to episode... This will be 21, 20, 19, 18, episode 17, the Primal People Convention. Pearl speaks about this theory of using this phosphorus powder for uh, basically a at-home cloaking technology that maybe Sasquatch use. I don't know if you believe in something like that. Or how do you think they... You think, Ron, that they're, they manipulate matter. They don't necessarily need a chemical that they have to sit there and, you know, like a caveman rub all over them or ingest. You think that maybe through their vocal cords, they're able to manipulate energy and matter. Is that right? Yes, I do. I don't know if it's through their vocal cords or not, but that's my theory. I Mm -hmm. do think they have to be manipulating matter to do what they do. I don't think they need a substance or anything like that to do that. I think Mm -hmm. we can all manipulate matter if you just knew how to connect with it Mm -hmm. and how to reach into the actual quart part of your cell, you know, way into where the the protons and all that stuff works. And uh, you just realize there's so much empty space in that, in the nucleus there that Mm -hmm. I listened to a program this morning, how much space there is between the nucleus and the outside of the, uh, of the uh, cell. And it's all considered consciousness. And there's only one part Mm -hmm. that's really matter and that mm-hmm. changes it at will it depends on your consciousness so and you, you connect all that with the uh, electrons going around and uh, in fact i heard it said that the uh, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you thought the uh, <clears throat> the nucleus was the size of a suv <clears throat> the uh excuse me the cell was a, the atom was <clears throat> if the atom was the size of an suv and uh, your nucleus was a, would be the size of a pea and, and to get to the electron that's on the outside there circling, it's 85,000 miles. Oh, wow. There's a lot of space in there. And our consciousness is what occupies that space. Mm-hmm. And that, that consciousness can actually manipulate the matter that's coming in. When one uh, cell connects with another one, that matter combines. And first thing you know, you've got all this stuff going together, which grows into a tissue or something like that. It gets into other parts first, like like a chemical that mm-hmm. gets into uh, uh, it's a long story I don't have it all straight yet but it's <laughs> it's quite interesting what I was listening to a while ago what steps have you guys taken to expand your consciousness because if this is a matter of technique if this is a matter of opening your pineal gland if this is a matter of relaxation and breathing and meditation if it's getting closer to you know God have you guys felt that you've expanded your consciousness over the last, let's say, 10 years? And what has it done for you as far as getting to know the answers to these questions, Sean? Uh, I find just getting out in nature where a lot of this stuff seems to happen, um, you know, disconnect from technology, get back out to the wilds and, you know, sit down, take a chair, mm-hmm. listen, watch, uh, you know, you don't technically have to be spiritual to experience a lot of this kind of stuff but um, you know I don't there n- nobody has all the answers um, 
this half of us don't even know what the questions are at this point. <laughs> right. It's all about what questions do I ask? I think that is spiritual, Sean, what you just said. When you're out there like that, you're just meditating, and mm -hmm. that's, that's where you connect with, with your, this, who you really are as mm -hmm. a being because uh, we're just occupying these bodies. And uh, uh, anyway, it's, right. it's a good question. Meditation is what Carrie and I do, mm -hmm. and uh, we do that every morning. And I think if you just it's, it's allowing something to come in. It's just kind of opening up and just not thinking. The term now, wait a second. Do you set aside time to actually sit there in silence every morning? Yes. Or you yes, do? do. As part of like a repetition. You've got to get out of your monkey mind, they call it. <laughs> Stop thinking. Just, just be and you just be quiet. And then let things come to you instead of trying to make something happen with your monkey mind. Monkey mind. Uh, monkey, that's a good term. <laughs> you're trying to get to the monkey mind is what you're trying to do. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's just being simple, trying to uh, not not create something that. Uh, yeah. That's the difference between I think people call it prayer. If you're asking for something, you know, but mm -hmm. if you're trying to receive something that's called meditation, mm -hmm. and you just kind of open up your your head. I've heard it said that your eighth, eighth chakra is 16 inches above your head. Is what I've heard. Mm -hmm. If you can open that up into your pineal gland, which is the seventh mm -hmm. chakra, you're you're going to maybe receive something, and that's what connects to your brain. Your heart, you have to get the feeling from your heart and get the coherence going throughout your body to get simple and make things happen with, with what you want to happen, not what you see is what's happening. So have you utilized any of these techniques to manifest a Sasquatch sighting? <laughs> no, I have not. Come to think of it, that's a good question. But I have utilized the techniques successfully. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's how Carrie and I got together. If you read my quantum book I got a whole part in there about manifesting what I thought I wanted in the perfect woman you know mm -hmm. and she comes along and I try to talk her out of me but she still wants to be with me and she's perfect you know, she's got everything that I've asked for and a little bit more sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah again the girls are in the backyard so we can talk about whatever we want let's talk about Lisa first <laughs> alright boys will be boys I guess there's no more proof than the way we ended that conversation. It was a great time. We actually spent some time uh, doing a night sit uh, in the back of our property there. I don't think anything really extraordinary happened. Oh yeah, wait, we did see some uh, unexplained, what I would call blinkers. I'm telling you, you gotta look in the sky and see these blinkers for yourself. And I I have to mention this UFO footage out of Cottage Grove, Oregon that was shot a week and a half ago. I'm going to urge anybody listening this to this to go to the Owl Moon Lab. I'm going to upload tonight some extraordinary UFO footage here, and I'll explain what you're looking at. What I will tell you is that the camera is being held perfectly still, and what you're seeing on the camera is what's happening in real time. The witnesses saw this with their own eyes so this is an accurate representation this is not camera distortion camera moving this is not automatic focus screwing up you're seeing what you're seeing as close as this thing would allow you to see a thousand feet off the deck and um, the object is anywhere besides the size of a Volkswagen bug or um, I think they said like a tractor so in between that size there so I'm not going to tell you any more than that. you got to go to the Owl Moon Lab on Facebook and see it for yourself. O-W-L, Moon, is in Moon, Lab, L-A-B. And the book, coming out in 2020, Volume 1, on the Owl Moon Lab. I'll tell you more about that soon. As always, if you'd like to be a guest or you have any guest ideas, you can get in touch with me at Strange Brow Radio. B-R-A-U, Strange Brow Radio. Shoot me a message on Facebook, Instagram, and the shows, I swear to God, they're all going to be on YouTube really quick. I keep saying that. They are going to be on YouTube. But shoot me a message. Let me know that you're listening. You can find us right now on iTunes and Podbean. This Thursday, I'm heading to an ET discussion group with Dave Emmons. He was a prior guest on here. Extra, extra military clearance. So I'm headed up to do a one-on-one -on -one with Dave Emmons and the ET discussion group. And we'll see if we can get an interview out of that one. We'll check that out. As always, thanks for listening. 
Thank you again to Sponsor Farrell by Aaron at Etsy.com and Marcia K. Moore. Welcome aboard. Awesome. Hey, I'll see you in the trees. <laughs>